Hello everyone, I hope you guys are having a wonderful evening, and today I am going to answer a very simple question. Should you read Cicero's De Oratore, uh, or to go by the English uh, title, On the Orator by Cicero? Um, and the answer to that question is a little... I, not not complicated, but it's a little bit more nuanced than it's it's not a yes or no question. Um, well, it is a yes or no question, but it's not a yes or no answer that I'm going to give. Um, and you know, I'll get into that further in the video. But um, you know, before I get to the review, uh, to give a little bit of background, Cicero uh, wrote a lot of books about oratory because that was like his thing. Um, in ancient Rome, uh, a politician had kind of, you know, he, he had one kind of route to go when it came to ascending the political ladder, but there were different ways he could um, ascend said, you know, figurative ladder, you know. Um, if he wasn't the best speaker, he could distinguish himself in the military and kind of just ride his his sort of um, reputation that way. Um, Cicero was not a military man at all. He hated being a soldier. He hated being in the military. You know, he bit, he did literally the bare minimum uh, in his uh, military service. Um, rather, he built himself up, built his image up in the law courts. And in the law courts, you give a lot of speeches. Uh, he was a lawyer. Um, you know, some of his most famous moments, most well-known moments come in these law courts, you know. Uh, for example, um, his uh, campaign, or, you know, his, his, his law case against Veres, or Veres, um, a governor of, not Corsica, Sicily, uh, a very corrupt former governor of Sicily, and um, it was like his first major case, and, you know, the odds were against him because Veres was a very uh, well-connected man, um, but somehow, you know, Cicero won, and, you know, it was like his big arrival on the political, the kind of Roman political world, so to speak. And then you, of course, have, you know, his big speeches in the Senate and, uh, you know, addresses to the people, too. Uh, whenever you talk about the Catiline orations or the Philippics, which are actually, I believe, mostly written more than spoken, because um, they were 15 and all, and I don't think he was able to actually give addresses on, like, a, a couple of them. Um, but yeah, and in addition to giving these famous speeches, he wrote a lot about oration. Um, in fact, he he wrote down his speeches as well, and he sort of um, he doesn't write them verbatim, but rather he writes kind of what that ideally should have been. So he'll like correct himself. He'll um, He'll kind of uh, clean up anything that he kind of misspoke about maybe in his speeches. Um, so even in his, in the text of his speeches himself, you see him kind of, uh, you know, brushing it up a little bit and kind of um, sprucing it up. Uh, but yeah, so you have that so little bit of background. And the other thing too is that the, this book, um, on the orator was a part of his kind of literary effort after he retired from public life during the mid 50s BCE. Um, you know, he kind of, uh, during this time, he kind of has a bit of a philosophy kind of spurt. And while this isn't a philosophical text in the sense that, you know, he, he isn't good, like, writing about a philosophical truth or any kind of high-minded thing. It is about being an orator. Um, he kind of approaches it from kind of like a philosophical angle. Um, he even goes so far as to put this in a dialogue, uh, a dialogue between um, 
famous Roman speakers from before his time, you know, like the, uh, the main speaker, or one of the main speakers is this man named Crassus. And Crassus is known as like the eminent orator before Cicero, like the previous generation's big, uh, great orator. Uh, there's another man named Antony, who is a, uh, not dissonant, ancestor of the famous triumvir Mark Antony. Um, but this Antonius is uh, also a super, super famous speaker. And those two characters, there are other characters, but those two main characters are kind of the principal speakers in this. Uh, there is one exception, which I will get into when I talk about the kind of nuts and bolts of the story. Um, and so he kind of also approaches this book from a kind of philosophical standpoint in the sense that he kind of, he doesn't just give a guide for being a good speaker, but he kind of goes over the theory um, behind the methods that he employs to a certain extent. He obviously doesn't go into super big amount of detail um, because this is a limited number of pages and he even mentions in the text at certain points that, uh, you know, I, I could give a lot more detail about this, but time is pressing. Um, again, both because there are limited other pages, but, you know, in the story, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very confined to its, um, the amount of time that the speakers are there and, and stuff like that. So to go a little bit over the story, because there is loosely a story, um, a bunch of young politicians are staying at Crassus's uh, country estate at Tusculum, um, and they kind of sort of, uh, you know, get into a, de a not a debate, but a discussion, uh, a, s a sort of symposium, not uh, exactly one to one, because symposiums were more of a Greek thing, and the Romans, you know, did things a little bit differently, um, but kind of like a discussion party. And it turns into kind of the, the younger politicians picking the brain of, and the beginning crassus, and then Antonius jumps in to give, like, give his own views on uh, being the, a good speaker. And the obvious, uh, the obvious reason for that being the subject of their discussion is that the young politicians want to learn from these, initially, again, just crassus, but, uh, you know, eventually both of them um, they want to learn from them and learn how to be a, a great speaker because, you know, they kind of, they still have their whole lives ahead of them, whereas Antonius and Crassus are very old men at this point. Um, in fact, in the beginning of book two, uh, this work is divided into three books. You can even see uh, the, the book title was there. Um, in the beginning of book two, uh, Cicero goes over how Crassus actually dies a few days after the setting of the book. He kind of gives his like coup de grace speech about how um, this one politician needs to be punished because he kind of breaks the rules in a way that's like against the dignity of the Roman Republic and he's, you know, he's, he's trying to get power for himself and stuff like that, all this stuff. And then he dies of, you know, mysterious circumstances, uh, old age, illness of some kind, something like that. Um, so the, the speakers, uh, Crassus in the beginning of the, of the work, you know, um, well, in the beginning, beginning of the work, Cicero himself kind of gives an introduction and he talks about how, you know, it's not that, um, there are not good um, or not talented people in in the city of Rome because the whole thing is that oratory is very hard and there are so few great orators. Um, in his day, it was it was like just Cicero and um, you know a, cu a couple of other like good speakers. Um, you could count Julius Caesar in there. Um, you can count a couple more. But Cicero kind of stood out, and then in, in the previous generation, you had like these two figures who were the big standouts, and then you can go further back. But among 
you know, you have these handful of great speakers among like the hundreds of Senate members and, you know, so many of them just don't know, you know, how to be a good orator or how to be a great orator, I should say. And he kind of um, attributes this in his address to Quintus because the book is dedicated to Quintus, his brother, Cicero's brother, Quintus. And he talks about how it's not a lack of talent, but rather the fact that Orish, you know, being an orator is so hard and there's so many facets of, of uh, knowledge that you have to be well versed in. It's not just enough to be like a good speaker and kind of have good cadence and diction and stuff like that. You have to be well read when it comes to political science and philosophy and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, after he introduces the characters and the setting and stuff like that, Crassus's first um, first few dozen pages of his speech are dedicated to this very topic, how an orator needs to kind of do these different things to kind of educate himself and learn to be a great orator. He has to, you know, learn the Latin language well and to be able to speak it fluidly. He has to train his voice so that, you know, he can be strong speaking throughout the whole speech. He has to learn history and political science and philosophy and, you know, be really, really well informed about the kind of current events in addition to like historical precedences in case he needs to kind of allude to something in his speech. All this stuff. Um, and he goes over the kind of training of an orator and all this stuff. And then Antonius actually disputes a couple of the things that Crassus says because in this book Antonius kind of represents the Greek view of oration because he kind of spends a lot of time with them when he's being trained. Um, and Antonius kind of gives his version of events where you don't need to kind of uh, go all over the place for your education. You just need to practice oration. That should be the big focus, practice over speech. Um, and Crassus himself even kind of uh, talks about, yes, you know, practice is important, maybe even the most important thing, um, but their big kind of dispute and something that they sort of go back and forth on is to what extent an orator, a great orator, has to be sort of, um, you know, well, well, uh, well educated about many disparate and kind of, uh, um, sort of different um, aspects of, uh, you know, an educated person's kind of repertoire, um, you know, a diverse field of knowledge, so to speak. Um, and so they kind of go back and forth throughout the whole work. Um, there is a 50 page kind of, di you know, um, kind of diatribe, so to speak, when a third speaker, because in book two, two more characters join who are kind of like in the middle of their career. Um, and one of them is Lucius Julius uh, Caesar, who is the, who is a distant cousin of the famous Julius Caesar, um, the famous triumvir and dictator and stuff like that. Um, and he talks about comedy because um, in addition to kind of what an orator needs to prepare himself for, he the the book also kind of goes over the you know every aspect of a speech and everything you can employ to kind of um, you know make your speech better, uh, you know, and this includes like styles of speaking and stuff like that, um, but this also includes humor and using humor in your speech and kind of comedic timing and stuff like that. And so you have this character, Lucius Julius Caesar, who kind of uh, gives his kind of spiel about that because uh, that's something that he's good at, apparently, or at least something that he's uh, well known or knows a lot about, I should say. Um, so with that being said, that's sort of like the bare, bone ba bare bones basics of the story. I don't want to get into too much detail because that would take a lot of time and I want to leave, in, in case you do want to read it, I want to leave that to you. But 
Um, so as for my recommendation, um, I think this is a very uh, interesting work. I obviously, you know, enjoyed it because um, this is, you know, reading this kind of stuff and this subject is, is the thing I study in life. Um, but for the average person, I would say that in this book, there are definitely a lot of great ideas that you can take away with, you know, because I think a lot of people need to kind of uh, be, have some sort of knowledge about public speaking to a certain extent. You know, obviously there are exceptions and obviously there are people who, who aren't comfortable with that kind of thing and so kind of uh, live their life differently. Um, but I think there are a lot of important uh, things to take away from this book. However, um, for most people, um, I don't think I would recommend reading the full text because it is very long and it's very um, uh, complicated. It's, it's one of the more kind of uh, complicated translations uh, I've read, um, you know, because the content is very dense and it's very kind of, uh, it's going over a lot of information and stuff like that. Um, so what I would recommend is if you could find a sort of kind of greatest hits of this book, um, or if you could find uh, like a, um, you know, sometimes these ancient works have kind of like um, editions of them where they take out uh, like selections, the, like the most important selections of these works. If you could find something like that for this book, uh, for On the Orator, uh, that would be my recommendation. Because again, I think there are some really important um, facts or sort of, uh, you know, uh, things that Cicero kind of considers important for being a public speaker uh, in this book. And I think there's a lot to learn from a book like this, but I don't think it's something you have to read the entire thing to get something out of. Um, if you're a huge Cicero fan or you are a, you know, a dedicated classicist like I am, um, I, I, I would say go ahead and read the whole thing. Um, it is a very enjoyable book, although it is also very dry at the same time. Um, it's not the most compelling narrative. Uh, I, yeah, you know, it's not a book that's focused on the story that much. Again, as I said, with the exception of the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of events that take place after the dialogue in the beginning of book, of, of one of the books, uh, when it talks about, um, Crassus's final few days, um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. If you read this book, uh, tell me what you think below, or if this review is helpful, please tell me in the comments below. Um, yeah, other than that, I would encourage you guys to subscribe uh, if you do find these reviews helpful. And other than that, I hope you guys have a good night.